Gentlemen, please take your seats. We are about to get started. Marketing and distributing your documentary once it hits the international film festival circuit. This is such an important topic because so many of us make our films, we get our world premiere, and then what do we do? Um, so this panel is geared specifically to answer the questions around documentaries, distribution, unique ways in which documentaries have been distributed, which companies are helping documentaries get distributed, and which networks and channels are picking them up. So you'll hear from a range of perspectives on this panel. I would like to introduce, first of all, Sai Abhishek, the head of Factual and Lifestyle Cluster South Asia, Warner Brothers Discovery. Sai, please come up on stage. Let's give him a round of applause, guys. We have Mita Suri, film program producer, Sheffield Dockfest. Hi, Mita. All the way here from Sheffield, England. Let's give her a round of applause. We have Samarth Mahajan. He's a writer, director, and his most recent documentary, Borderlands, just won the National Award. Let's give him a huge round of applause. Last but not least, we have Suganda Makijani. She's the manager of content and licensing at Film Caravan and is currently helping out with God knows how many documentaries and feature films all across the platforms. Let's give her a round of applause. And our fantastic, fantastic moderator who's been in this space for the last two and a half decades, Anshul Kapoor, documentary curator and programmer for a series of festivals that she will speak about. Guys, this is a very, very imminent panel. We've curated it with so much love. Anshul, please take over from here. Nitin, we love you. Good afternoon, everyone. We'll just d dive into the conversation so that we can have time for Q&A. We've heard documentary filmmakers ask several questions over the years. Who will fund my documentary? Where will I show it? Who will see it? Who will talk about it? Those questions have been evolving. Who will co-produce it? We have so much buzz happening at Film Bazaar. We have documentary at Film Bazaar this year as well. Who will distribute my uh, documentary? When and how will it get its international film festival premiere? And that's really what we're going to talk about here. And I know this is not enough. We could spend a whole day talking about documentaries, uh, but we're going to stick with marketing and distribution your documentary once it hits the international film festival circuit. Thank you all of you for being here. Um, between us, we have, I think, a lot of, lot of value to add, and I hope uh, we can do that in these 45 to 50 minutes that we have. I want to start with uh, you, Mita, because you are the festival person here uh, by default. So when, the fest when a film hits Sheffield Dock Fest, what is it that you enable in terms of avenues to fulfill the expectations that filmmakers may have from the festival? Um, so Sheffield is an amazing festival, no bias. Uh, and it is the biggest one in the UK and certainly the most impactful, certainly one of the most impactful markets. So you're in a really, really um, influential space. Our biggest audiences are industry and they're always there. They always respect the festival and they want to come and see the documentaries. So the curation is respected um, and is always innovative and curious. So I think the connections that we have and the people that we bring in um, allow networking for the filmmakers. And then also a lot of engagement with press and an excellent audience that provides a lot of um, comfort, joy. It's a very socialist space. It's a very um, non-hierarchical space. So you get a lot of um, lateral engagement with the audiences and the industry that get that. So comfort. And just if you can s dwell a little bit more in terms of how do you actually then make those connections or avenues that you open up for the documentary to go beyond the festival? Um, it is very, very truly very easy to make connections in Sheffield. Just because everybody is accessible, it's a small space, and it's a very welcoming space. When I started there, that was how I could start there, is that as a volunteer who was just introduced to many people and people responded to me very easily, um, and I think it's very similar with filmmakers. I was telling somebody earlier that I've seen deals happening in the line to the loo. So, you know, everybody's eager to talk, everybody's engaged. Um, and there are also facilitation for networking. So 
you know, you have specifically um, curated spaces where you meet the right people for producers to speak to filmmakers, filmmakers to speak to each other, broadcasters to speak about what they want, uh, because they're all there and we can ask them for that information. Great, thank you. Um, can I come to you, Sai? Um, you know, do you see festival films entering your space as, as uh, you know, as Warner Brothers Discovery, uh, or do you see festival films as a benchmark for the films that you might directly commission? I mean, it's a very good question. Um, so we don't discriminate with festivals or non-festival films. We look at the story and the power of those stories and the way it, uh, you know, these stories are told and, and the craft of it. So naturally, having a few uh, credible awards, uh, if it's been around the world, uh, you know, those things definitely help, uh, but it's not a, uh, you know, we don't necessitate that uh, as part of our commissioning process or uh, acquisition process. Uh, but having said that, I think uh, the level of uh, film festivals and the, you know, that's coming out of India also could contribute to maybe elevating some of these docs before they come to uh, a network like us, because what we do as Warner Brothers Discovery is also spend some time with these sometimes first time filmmakers or maybe even experienced filmmakers to, uh, who are used to producing in a certain way in the past, but then also bridging that creative gap. So we spent a lot of time in development to make that more palatable for, uh, not just for a television audience, but also for an OTP platform. And we go around the world as well with some of our docs within the Warner Brothers Discovery uh, network. So, so I would say yes, it helps, uh, but it's not necessary. Um, content licensing, I mean, this is something that's kind of happening now. We can see this in the generation of documentary cinema. Um, Suganda, um, what would you, has your experience been in terms of actually the trajectory uh, that a film takes uh, in the caravan that you kind of lead for it from a content licensing uh, perspective? Thank you, Achal, a wonderful question. Um, I want to say something before I start, that if you've made something with love and passion, if it's a story that you wake up every morning to, I promise you I will sell that and I will represent that with equal amount of passion. Um, at Film Caravan, uh, we've had years of experience of, um, you know, distributing films on various digital platforms. Um, we don't just look for a digital platform, we are looking for the perfect platform that will not just appreciate the content, uh, but they should also position it correctly and elevate it uh, to the uh, place it deserves to be, you know. Um, I think nonfiction is something that's growing day by day because we are inspired by real stories today, uh, you know. Um, I'll just give you two examples. Um, I have distributed a documentary called Kages Ki Kashti based on Jagjit Singh's life. Beautiful music, uh, his journey, he lost a young son, teenage son, and then how his music changed after that. And so we had to decide which platform to go to. We went through lots of platforms and we decided Amazon would be a good platform because um, it penetrates to the country and rest of the world also, you know. And it worked magic. Um, another example I would like to share is a documentary made by director uh, Andre Severny. He lives in New York. Wonderful man, wonderful director. Uh, it's called Buried Seeds. And it's based on the life of Chef um, Vikas Khanna, Michelin's Chef Vikas Khanna. His journey from a humble background in Amritsar to being the number one chef in India today and the top ten in the world. Again, you know, we wanted to find it the correct home, you know. So we thought about it. He's also um, a judge on MasterChef India. And uh, he's so popular even in the heartland of India. So we selected National Geographic Channel. Uh, I have a great collaboration with them. They know the content that comes from Film Caravan will be of a certain value. Um, and will also be clear in terms of um, you know, the ownership and the licensing rights, though that's important too. So we presented it to them. It was a super success. They released it on Independence Day, 15th August. There was a Twitter banter with Vikas Khanna where he's created a naan bread with the tricolor uh, uh, flag. You know, he put cheese in it, which became the white, and I, I don't know what he did with the uh, other two colors, but um, it was beautiful. So as Film Caravan, we promoted it. 
Vikas Khanna put um, uh, in New York. He's from New York, uh, Manhattan. And uh, there were billboards uh, in Manhattan. There were buses that uh, showed uh, bur uh, buried seeds. So it was a collaborative effort. And again, uh, it was a story of a super success. So yes, you know, um, please reach out to Film Caravan. Reach out to me. If you believe in your story, I believe in it. Thank you. I think that's a good beginning for, uh, you know, um, before we reach the filmmaker, Samar Mahajan, uh, young filmmakers who, uh, you know, as we see them come into the industry, we have so much hope and love for all of you, um, especially to represent the two stories that we all need uh, to be told as citizens of this country and the world. Uh, Samar, you know, festival premiere happens, right? And then somewhere we see the film is lost. We don't know where it's gone. Can you share from your experience, you know, how you have actually visibilized and outreached the film to reach the audience for which you think the film was made? Uh, can you share that from your experience, please? Thank you, Anshul. And I, I think uh, it's it's an interest, interesting question coming from you because you're one of the people who's helped the film reach more places. I think uh, Anshul runs the longest running film club uh, in India. Uh, it's called the City Film Club and they've been one of our partners. Uh, so I actually want to share some experiences from uh, the last film we made. Uh, it's called Borderlands. And uh, I think I'll, I'll just request Ruchika to please pull up some visual aids. I think I made some... Uh, visual aids to let you understand, give you some context on what the film was. Uh, so it was a film about six characters from different border areas, lives defined by India's borders. And uh, we had a fairly long journey in terms of, uh, uh, you know, getting it made and the festival run. Uh, it was actually a partly crowdfunded project. Uh, we got our first selection at the Mami Mumbai Film Festival, which uh, unfortunately got postponed because of the pandemic. Uh, we had a world premiere at uh, Dogfest Munich. And you know, that's the moment like, you know, when we are discussing what happens to a film after the world premiere, that is the moment we actually started thinking that, okay, now we have world premiered. Uh, what do we do with the film? Uh, because we obviously like any filmmaker wanted more and more people to watch it. Uh, so we did do a, an intensive festival journey where we screened at a lot of festivals. Uh, but then the idea was then that we need to take this film to the general audiences. And uh, now, the state of affairs with feature documentaries in India is a little little bleak. I think it's better than ever. But even then, if you have made a film which is not a docu-series or doesn't have celebs, it is very difficult to distribute it to a mainstream OTT. And uh, even we uh, received a lot of rejection, which is part and parcel. Like I think all filmmakers would know that rejection is part and parcel of life. Uh, but we still wanted more people to watch the film, and especially South Asian audiences to watch the film. Uh, so, uh, can you just move move the slide? So what we did was uh, essentially we realized that okay we are not getting an OTT release, and uh, I still want people to watch the film. Uh, what I did was and on a whim, uh, especially after we got a national award for editing, I was like, you know, this is a good marketing tool I've gotten for more Indian audiences to watch the film. Uh, so we started identifying all these film clubs in India. And uh, we focused a lot on film clubs which have their own organic audience. Now, how do we judge the audience is a little twisted because you end up going to their Instagram page and just seeing how many followers they have. Have they been active? And uh, we realized that there are actually many. And uh, so we made a list of about 20 festivals. And as you can see, uh, we wanted to go beyond the metros. So we uh, partnered with these film clubs which were even in places like Baroda, Imphal, Nagpur, Lucknow. A uh, lot of tier two cities also. And uh, just made this Excel sheet. This is literally a screenshot of an Excel sheet. I sometimes think that uh, like a lot of us filmmakers are Excel sheet filmmakers, right? Uh, we are creating all these databases. And uh, wrote an email to them, like a nice email introducing my film, their, its journey. And wherever I would see that they do ticketed screenings, I offered a 50-50 you know, split on revenue. And uh, it sort of made it a win-win situation for the film club and us. And uh, just sort of started this uh, in, a, in a way that, you know, I reached out to them at one go. And we planned these 20-odd screenings in three months. And uh, together pulled in sources to do PR and, you know, reach out to f newspapers and journalists we knew. And uh, can we move to the next slide? 
and uh, we actually got a decent response. I think we had about 20, 25 screenings. Most of them were packed. Uh, even the ticketed screenings sold out. And one major thing that played into the equation was that these uh, film clubs had their own audience. So that took away the pressure from me to actively, I'm not the only person marketing the film. And as you can see, these are very non-traditional screenings. Like in some of the places, we didn't even have chairs. So these are all mostly cinephiles who are even like ready to sit on the floor and watch a film. Uh, we didn't spend a single rupee in this uh, whole outreach. We actually, I mean, it's not a lot of amount, but we made about 3 lakh rupees, which is like a TV distribution deal in one particular territory. Uh, so this was uh, essentially uh, uh, what we did with physical distribution. And, uh, and then we realized that, you know, now this is done. Like, these, these are the number of film clubs that there are. We can't do more. And... Uh, you know, my, my producer, Asha, is attending the film bazaar. He's not here. But, you know, we talked a lot and we decided finally that let's put it out on YouTube. Now, that's not the best thing to do for an indie filmmaker because that also means that you are sort of putting out your content for free. And uh, especially in a, uh, in a situation where we have distribution in South Korea but not India. But, I mean, the situation is we want more Indians to watch it. Uh, but then how do you... Uh, like make this release dignified because we don't want to just put it out on YouTube and for no one to watch it. Uh, so we did this thing where, you know, there's a term called Filmstagram. Uh, a lot of, in and I, I have some uh, people here, I think Anshika's here, who's ex I, she runs a channel called When Rajma Meets Rice. So a uh, so lot of cinephiles on Instagram who uh, are running these pages and they have huge followership. So, and like an Excel sheet fi filmmaker, I'm also an email filmmaker. Like, you know, you get into this habit of writing emails. So what we did was essentially wrote to a lot of Instagrammers, uh, again, just told them the story of the film and uh, gave them a credit, like a digital media partner credit, and told them that my film is releasing on 8th November, 5 p.m. So the moment it's out, talk about it. And uh, if, if we can just move one slide. One, one more slide. Yeah, so these are all the 30 pages we collaborated with. You know, it, it includes people like Humans of Cinema and uh, Gangs of Cinefood. These are the bigger pages. But we also collaborate with a lot of people who have less followership. And uh, when we put out the film, within a week, we had like 2 lakh impressions and 30,000 views, which I think for an indie film with no backer, I thought it was decent. Uh, so, so yeah, so I think, uh, again, we created a win-win situation for them. They got a credit and we got the reach. Uh, so these are the two experiments we did with the film and, uh, I mean, got more eyeballs in South Asia. Thank you. Thank you so much. I was noticing how everyone had their mobiles on looking at your slides and kind of taking pictures of all those contacts. So, you know, I think it starts with the filmmaker, it goes to festivals, it goes to OTT, it kind of goes to distributors and all these different labs. Uh, but I think each, each, of, our, each of you have that role to play. We can't just hands off. Film, ban you know, it's made and then now somebody else will do it. So, I mean, I think that you show that pathway of that possibility. Um, and actually, I was thinking, Sai, you know, because you are, you know, doing a lot of programming and uh, creation of for your channels and have done also in the past from your own personal trajectory career, um, you know, when you see this pool of talented documentary filmmakers, who catches your eye? How do you actually support their filmmaking trajectory? What can all of, our, all of the people here kind of gain from your experience and your platform? Samarth caught our eye. <laughs> we, okay. we worked with Samarth on one of our, uh, a documentary series that we did. So naturally, people who are passionate like Samarth and many filmmakers, I'm sure, are out here. Um, we don't, uh, you know, we don't expect that they would come with already having made like 10, 20 documentaries and having gone around the world. Of course, th th that's a lot to expect, especially in our country where, like I've said this in other places as well, the the documentary ecosystem and the, the traditional film ecosystem haven't moved at the same pace, uh, purely for various reasons we'll not go into on this panel. But uh, so essentially we look at even first timers uh, or experienced uh, filmmakers. And again, the, the most important thing that we look forward to is uh, uh, authorship. You know, people with a voice, 
and not a generic sort of here's a story and here are a rundown of events of this is how it happened. I think now we're seeing more and more of it uh, perpetuating with the character driven, story driven, with a lot of heart, uh, you know, and the, I think the tenacity of the filmmaker to follow through on that story because a lot of these docs take years to make. Uh, of course, if I put my festival hat out and put my network hat on, uh, there's of course a certain uh, type of genres that our audiences are used to and also a lot of new audiences are probably seeing documentaries for the first time. So they're also not, they don't know the pecking order between what's a festival type of documentary versus what's on OTT. So it's a bit of, you need to give them a bit of a, a bouquet of things and then, you know, we've seen audience for all kinds of documentaries and not just a certain genre per se. So, uh, and to be honest, we're a very young sort of uh, documentary viewing culture, at least now with the exposure going up on social media and foreign films we're seeing really uptake in uh, all kinds of documentaries and all kinds of different genres. So, uh, and we're not, uh, to be honest, in Bombay, in Mumbai, there's a certain type of filmmakers there who are used to being around reality TV and uh, in, in the larger sort of commercial cinema. But then a lot of uh, authentic voices, uh, you know, are coming out from small towns who are probably not used to even being, uh, who have not been absorbing global cinema or anything of that nature. So, in fact, more authentic stories I, I see at least coming out. And what we do at least at a network level, if I can, I'll wrap that up, that essentially, even if they don't know how to make films, we would marry them to line producers or development teams, or if researchers come to us or somebody would just have a story, we would do that bridge and ensure that the production part of it is taken care of so the filmmaker can focus on the creative and we kind of handhold them through the process. And we have a number of examples. We've done that on My Daughter Joined the Cult, of course, which came with a very credible, uh, you know, Vice uh, as a production partner. Uh, and then we've had, um, what are the, uh, we've been working on a bunch with a lot of investigative journalists who I, I, I can't uh, name them here, but they're already in partnership with another production house to you know, handhold them through the process of production itself. So, yeah, so I guess it's a bit of everything. So we're kind of doing the marriage between idea, story, creation, development, production, execution, and then distribution. So it's a, it's a kind of a full, full blown process. I mean, this is fantastic. I mean, you know, the fact that we have a global world and the pot potential for this support and you know, I'm I'm so glad that you mentioned also filmmakers coming from smaller towns and small uh, places because I think um, we have to expand this uh, this space. Uh, but of course, filmmakers are always looking for these connections and or uh, you know panels and uh, places like this. Uh, the voices from here should go out. So not just uh, from us who take this, but take it out of these rooms and out of Goa and you know. Uh, to talk about it so that people connect with platforms like this. Um, you know, I was thinking, coming back to you, Meeta, of, uh, you know, Sheffield Doc is uh, one of the top five documentary film festivals. Uh, and I know that when we look at a film information, we're looking at festivals. Everyone is looking at festivals. What is unique about Sheffield Doc? And what do you kind of lock in when you make that selection to the festival? Thank you, that's a difficult question. Um, and the creative process has definitely evolved through the years as well as programmers have also learned um, sort of the different aspects to keep in mind. And for Sheffield specifically, we do um, very organic programming. So we have an open submissions program, which is open now. So if you're interested in submitting, you definitely can. Um, and in terms of that, we're re very responsive to what we receive. I think we don't want to set any caveats before um, we make any selections because we don't want to lose the chance of seeing something truly valuable. Um, we are very aware of uh, the films that have been released, of their festival trajectory, and how we can support films that uh, have not been seen very widely, have come from smaller film festivals, even if they have had a premiere and haven't had a larger audience. So those aspects are very uh, crucial to when we make selections and try and support films. 
you got the kind of thing? Yeah. yeah. I think, and I'm sure there are going to be questions, so I'm going to leave some of my questions out and uh, kind of let the audience uh, pitch that in. Um, I wanted to come um, back to, um, you know, Samarth now. Uh, we often get, over the years, we've got different kinds of emails. I'm sure a lot of you get them. Madam, can you tell how to make an award-winning film? Uh, can somebody tell us how to make a film get to a festival? How do I make a festival film? How do I get it premiered? And so I'm just thinking, are filmmakers like you and your peers talking about thinking of a festival strategy? And I hope it's more than just an international festival strategy. Um, if you can talk about that. Right. Thank you, Anchal. And I, I think that's really the heart of a lot of uh, conversation around how do we get our film out. Uh, so in fact, uh, what I have realized uh, over the years is the journey actually begins even before the film is made. At a place like Film Bazaar, because uh, there are labs across the world. And even Sheffield has a great uh, market called Meat Market. right? So uh, you, I think as filmmakers, I think there needs to be a realization that uh, we can actually go to these venues and talk to programmers while our film is being made. Uh, because the frank reality is that every festival is getting about, like, I don't know, 5,000, 10,000 films. So it's better that, you know, you put a face to your film and uh, sort of, uh, like, really make your presence felt, uh, in even in labs. Also because the world premiere tag is very important. And I, I'm sure, like, I mean, you might have something to add here, but, I mean, uh, a world premiere is very important because that sort of becomes a first screening and your it dictates your festival journey. So again, like coming back to emails and Excel sheets, uh, I think uh, once you've figured out where we're going to world premiere, I think one of the first things that needs to be done is to create a database. And rather than asking a question that how do we make an award-winning film, I think the question is what is the right film festival strategy for my film? Uh, sometimes you'll get a festival or sales agent, but especially when you're making it for your own, I think the different kinds of festivals, there are definitely A-list festivals where everyone wants to premiere, like Cannes, Sundance. Uh, but there are also uh, thematic festivals, right? Like there are festivals which focus on human rights, gender. There are genre-specific festivals. Like some festivals just focus on doc documentaries. Some festivals just focus on short films. Uh, then there are festivals which are about communities. For example, even Jitin, Jan, two festivals, right? Uh, NYC and DWF, South Asian Film Festival which m might happen in US. And maybe you made a film which is more for uh, a South Asian or a diaspora audience. So why not explore those festivals? Like Tasveer is a great example, Rita sitting here. So, uh, and, then, uh, and then national festivals. You know, India also has some great festivals. We have IDSFFK. You know, whenever I take this name, I'm like half asleep by the, by the time I finish the name. It's a long name, but it, it's India's uh, Oscar qualifying documentary festivals happens in Kerala great rebellious spirit. So the, the festival strategy needs all these things. And uh, why also because you know you go to a site like Film Freeway and there are thousands of festivals. And I have actually talked to some friends who were very happy about their film being at Cannes World Film Festival. But Cannes World Film Festival is not Cannes Film Festival. And I think <laughs> that's something that you know it's, it's sometimes as a, as a young filmmaker you don't realize. Uh, second is the power of uh, uh, waiver emails. I think we don't utilize it enough. It, it might hurt the festival after all. But uh, with, with Borderlands, for example, we submitted to 250 festivals. And we had literally run out of festival budgets. And, and we realized that we could have sent it to all the festivals, even if we had like 6 lakh rupees. But we frankly did not have. So we wrote a lot of waiver emails. And we got about like 4 lakh rupees in just waivers. I mean, so I mean that really helped us just apply to more places. and. Um, I think the last aspect is there's going to be heartbreak. Generally, I think that the selection rate is 10%. If you apply to 200 festivals, you may get to 20 festivals. And I think that's just part of the filmmaking process. Your heart is, heart is broken again and again and again, and yet you, know, you, you have to be at it. So I think these are either some of the conversations we have or some of the learnings I've had in at least my journey. Thank you. I mean, I think Samarth is probably uh, you know, among those pure um, contemporary filmmakers who is uh, seeing the value of the festival circuit, uh, but also, as we heard from him before, reaching the ground level audience. Um, so I wanted to come to you, Suganda. You know, you are uh, somebody who's d in the distribution business. 
And so what is the criteria that you kind of uh, have in selecting the content uh, in the documentary space? Um, thank you, Atul. Uh, so I think documentaries need to be well-researched, um, authentic stories, inspiring. And I think if, if the narrative, you know, if the whole experience, uh, if, if the narrative just takes you into the experience, I think it can be very engaging, more than even fiction, um, I feel. Uh, for example, I was at the Mami screening a couple of weeks ago, and I saw this documentary called Zende. It is based on a cop called Madhuka Zende, who is from Pune. And um, the entire journey of the cop and how he catches the criminals and his personal life, uh, when the documentary finished, it organically got a standing ovation, and we had the cop standing in front of us, 86-year-old uh, Madhuka Zende. And it was unbelievable. The love that you can get uh, with due respect to social media, marketing, Instagram, Twitter, I think that one-on-one -on -one love and uh, feedback that you get um, at festivals is unparalleled, um, you know, compared to a like or a, or a post or, or a message. And um, when I saw uh, the cop, 86-year-old man standing in front of me, I had mixed emotions. I wanted to hug him and I wanted to touch his feet at the same time. You know, it was such a beautiful experience. So I think... Um, Stories that inspire, stories that educate, that make you, uh, you know, that make a, make a, I know it may sound very preachy, but that make some change in the world or some change in, in my growth. I think I look for that, you know, I look for a connect uh, and that's how I select. And festivals is a great way uh, to pick good documentaries, um, I think. Yeah, that's how I would select. You know, I mean, I think we need a whole panel on demystifying festivals as well, right? Uh, and really uh, kind of, you know, not just decoding them as Raghav uh, did our masterclass yesterday, but demystifying them. Because I think like Samarth, you mentioned, and, you know, uh, Sai and others, uh, that we have competitive festivals, we have curated festivals, uh, we also have thematic festivals, and um, festivals also have their own journeys, as do films. And so I really wanted to, uh, you know, and because you s spoke about this whole business of showing a film at a festival and having that audience interaction. Just wanted a few words from, uh, you know, from you, Meeta, in terms of, you know, what happens there in a festival space between the audience and the filmmaker and the film that gets premiered. I just want to echo what Samad says about the idea of figuring out the right festival for you. Like, it's just the festival journey is hard, and we're aware how hard it is, and definitely reach out for waivers. There's always no harm in asking. And, but there is a lot to put in time and effort to figure out what film is. Like, that's what we respond to as programmers. There's a lot of thought given into whether there is value in this film being part of this festival. Like, can we offer something? Can we offer the audiences? Can we offer the engagement that the audiences will bring? Like Sheffield is a very different city to London. And the press that attends there is very different to London Film Festival, which is also a fiction festival. So the engagement that the audiences have and the things that they go, go and watch is very different. And that is a lot, a big part of our curation because we owe it to the filmmakers who've put that time in to give them an audience, right? To give them a challenging audience who ask questions during the Q&A, who engage with the film, you know? And um, I think that's part of the experience as a filmmaker we would like them to have. And additionally, not even just uh, a public audience, but the industry that attends as well. I cannot speak for everyone, of the sales agencies, the distributors, but the ones that I've spoken to have been really interested when they are looking to pick up films, when they are curious about specific films to see what the audience reaction is and to be in that space to see who laughs where. Um, and um, also, I don't want to speak for you, but I'm pretty sure it's hugely impactful for the filmmaker to be there and see what the reaction for the audiences is. COVID was really hard when filmmakers couldn't come to the screenings uh, because you put all that work in and you don't get that connection, even if, it, even if we put it online. Like we putting films online for COVID, it gave it a wider reach because it went for Sheffield across the, uh, the country when people couldn't afford to come to Sheffield to see it. So they got a wider reach, but there was a lot of grief in not being able to be there physically and feel the room and feel the love, feel um, 
the terror and, you know, really connect. So there's nothing, I think, better than that. I mean, I'm so glad you talked about that because I think it is not just the process of distribution and marketing to, you know, who you're reaching, but it is also the audience and those reactions that play uh, an important role. I mean, um, I, I can tell you from my experience, when we haven't been able to bring filmmakers to screenings and festivals, we have now started, of course, post-COVID using Zoom. And we keep trying to shift the screen to the audience and the faces. But just even that already helps uh, for it to reach. So from one screening, a film gets picked up to other screenings and other festivals. Um, so Sai, I just want to come to you uh, one time and then we'll open it up to the uh, audience. You know, you are a digital space. So you, you, what's the audience feedback process that you get uh, to the f cinema that you present? Just a clarification on that. So we also have a very thriving linear business, which is the Discovery Channel and Animal Planet and all the other networks that we have in that portfolio. And we have Discovery Plus, which is our uh, OTT platform. So naturally, we've been around for uh, over 25 years in the country. So we uh, have a good sense of at least what people have been watching and consuming on uh, you know, a, a brand like Discovery. Uh, the second part of that is OTT. Of course, on the OTT side, as you all probably know, there's a lot of a analytics involved. A lot of we we know very specific uh, data on uh, you know how they're watching it, how long they're watching it for, uh, what else do they watch when they watch uh, this. So, uh, without hair splitting, we don't sit and crunch data on a daily basis, but we do get a sense of uh, what the audience. Uh, is interested in, and we try and gauge a lot of, this is also gut when we commission my team and I, uh, on what could be the wi white spaces that we could look at themes that have not, that maybe the audience is not used to this topic. So for the first time, uh, when we launched Discovery Plus for t during the pandemic, uh, we saw an explosion of uh, interest, especially on YouTube, and people organically started making reviews of documentaries and trailers and and we didn't do any, like, this was not marketing-led or PR-led or anything like that. Uh, it was just, people just wanted to talk about these documentaries, that they were just discovering it on their own. Uh, so we also look at that. I mean, um, that's also part of the feedback system. And the rest, we have always uh, fall back on the numbers and data to, to confirm or not confirm our own beliefs. Yeah. Great, thank you so much. I think I'm going to open it up to the audience because I know we're running on a delay, but we have some time for questions, if we'll take. So um, if anybody has questions for any of the panelists, you can raise your hand and the mics are going around. Of course, our questions can continue too as well. Yeah. Okay, there's somebody there. journalist uh, my question really is to answer the topic which is that you know the way Kamal has done a very you know determined focused distribution plan for his film which is almost like crowdsourcing an audience but if you wanted to get it you know to make the money that you've invested to get that back to actually get that kind of distribution that you know most filmmakers are seeking you know it's not very easy in, in India in particular we don't have natural formats I mean you know yes you have discovery and it's and Nat Geo and these are the few, but what is the struggle really for a filmmaker to take it from film festival to a much more mainstream mass sort of audience that it has in life that is beyond, you know, that one screening or, you know, five screenings? Okay. So there is this really interesting shift that's been there in distribution models that I think is really important to emphasize. Um, and we've and I think like what you would like in this situation is to work with a professional, a distributor, who would be able to support you, who would be able to give you a strategy. And the work that Samaj do has done is really extensive and probably immensely exhausting. And uh, even after, the after making a film, which you know, if you have to take up when you don't know exactly where to go, is tough. Um, so we did a survey in the UK called the cost of dot survey. And these are kind of some things that I feel like research is really great to know. Um, and what was concluded to a certain extent was that sales agents don't respond post world premiere. And that's really tricky. So like a place like this, a market, a forum like this where you're getting knowledge, uh, a space where you're connecting with people right from the start, 
is so important, I think. I think um, that really engaging with even distributors, perhaps when you don't think it's the right time, but also familiar f familiarizing yourself with them um, will really help because they will remember your film. They will be in a space where they'll talk to their colleagues and get a little bit more feedback, but also you will know them over a period of time and see whether they're taking the right your film in the right direction, whether you feel comfortable with them. <coughs> if you don't really connect with somebody in a space, um, you know, in a market, markets are maybe not easily accessible for everyone, they're, they can be expensive to attend, and you know, there are different types of barriers, and you get a festival invitation, a world premiere invitation, before even, I would say, before the announcement, speak to sales agents under embargo. Familiar, familiarize yourself with their slate. If you feel like you connect with their slate, like reach out to them and say, I have been selected for Sheffield Dockfest, my world premiere. It hasn't been announced yet, but will you have a look at my film? And I think like our festival is respected enough that people will say, oh, Sheffield has selected it. Why is that? Let me have a look. Hopefully, hopefully they're respected enough. But I just really want to emphasize like how things are changing. And we're struggling with it as well. We're struggling to make our spaces really relevant um, and to build, like that's why it's really important to show films that you wouldn't show elsewhere. Uh, but I think that's really important to know and prepare for. Uh, I'll just add, I think uh, just in addition to what you're saying, I think uh, with, the, with the idea of sales agents, it's when we're looking at uh, distribution beyond just the major OTTs, uh, say Netflix or Amazon Prime, uh, if you look at your distribution uh, territory-wise, you know, just look at, for example, you want to distribute in UK, so BBC is the right place. You want to distribute in South Korea, so you'll find a channel. So if you start breaking down your distribution strategy territory-wise, it, it becomes easier to sort of accumulate money, right? Because it's not like one big deal, but ma many small piecemeal deals. And I think sales agents have that network already that's why they're important. Okay, I think there's a question here. So please go ahead. Can somebody give him the mic? Vinod Ganatra. <laughs> documentary filmmaker. For years, I have been making documentary films and traveling here, there, and struggling for reaching audience. Now you, some of you are lucky to have audience or travel to different clubs. Now so many clubs have come in and you are invited there, but they don't give stay, they don't give travel. As a documentary, independent documentary filmmaker, it is a big question where to get money for travel and just to reach audience. M making, you have done it. Even freeway, also, you they charge $20. So if you have 200, then you have more money than to make film. How to solve that kind of problem? Because none of the, I have come across so many clubs, and none of them are ready to give you travel or and stay. Minimum, what? documentary filmmaker expects from them. Right. So ac actually, I mean, there are solutions to it. And one of the solutions is what Anshil literally proposed that, you know, whoever was not paying me or there were no ticketed screenings, I said, we'll do a Zoom Q&A. So I was literally sitting in my living room and the film played and we interacted with the audience online. Uh, but a lot of film clubs actually did uh, uh, pay us and especially because some of them were ticketed screenings, we split revenues. So there was enough money for me to travel uh, I don't have qualms asking my friends if they'll allow me to stay with them. So I am, uh, I think, very shameless sometimes. Uh, so that is one part of it. I think with Film Freeway, I think we're talking about the power, the importance of waiver emails. Every time you go on a Film Freeway page, there's an email ID of the director or the programmer. And I think you can very politely just write them an email saying that you're an independent film. Uh, I have done that. Uh, Rita has been kind enough to give me a waiver. Rita is sitting here. And... Uh, uh, I think if you can just share your story and, you know, I did share my screener also and they watched it and they gave me a waiver. And uh, I think, and that's what we were talking about, that uh, if, if, if 
the programmers feel that there's value in at least screening your film for the selection committee or they like your story, uh, then you will save money. But I do understand, and that's why it's, uh, it, it's important when you're budgeting for the film at the beginning. Many of the times we are only budgeting for making the film. I think festival strategy is something that needs to be part of the budget. Because with the help of technology, they make films. They make good films also. But reaching to audience or to the festivals, even none of the so, so many film festivals, they used to uh, invite filmmakers. Now, nowadays, you don't get, they said, we don't have that kind of fund due to resources and all, so we will not be able to invite. Now, abroad, I was at Amsterdam. Then Amsterdam, they said, uh, we will give you uh, stay, but we will not give you travel, which is for an Indian filmmaker to travel to tra Amsterdam is big money than what you are doing. Uh, watching on uh, virtual screenings and all this is like you have played, you have eaten, you have eaten. How do you you know, it's, look, it's, it's Mac, very you know, difficult for independent, small, yeah. young filmmakers are facing this problem. Please guide or please tell or think about it, how to get rid of this problem. Um, can I actually, uh, you know, Sai, uh, I was just kind of looking at you before responding myself because when OG, we've screened your film, as you know, uh, for many years with children audiences and haven't been able to call you. Uh, I think uh, many of us who are um, screening and not running festivals are doing them because of the content that is is the documentary and the kind of impact that you know we want that content to create. So I'm just putting this out to I'm starting with you, but you know the others can also respond. Do you feel that now that we have all these different bridges and connections, can can the different uh, platforms collaborate? festival, sales agents, distribution networks, platforms like yours, efforts of young filmmakers, where we actually also invest in the alternative distribution network building process to create impact screenings, to actually support filmmakers to be there with their films. And of course, perhaps we won't get all filmmakers everywhere, but if we can create that diversity and inclusion, through a collaborative process. Is that something that all of you here would be able to actually venture into? I mean, I can tell you from uh, our network on, uh, I mean, at least at Warner Brothers Discovery, we have a very robust uh, network with distributors, not only in India, but also around the world. We speak to a lot of them, sales agents, distributors, producers, independents, as well as very established ones. And we're already doing a version of this. But having said that, I do know that we're not attending as many festivals. Uh, not for the lack of uh, flight and stay, but uh, we just haven't been as active as we should have been. I've been quite public about uh, these in other forums as well. So we do intend to be more uh, you know, present and send some of our team members to be part of this to scout for films and docs and really create some sort of resurgence. And we really want to put our you know, boots to the ground. And absolutely, I believe this is the right time to channel film clubs, like Samad said, uh, you know, our uh, established sales agents like uh, Suganda, and uh, as well as the you know, festival people like Nita. And I think there's a lot of uh, stories that can be mined. And, a l and I even yesterday on the panel at EFI, I could just see a lot of people just not knowing how to, how do we make, wh where do we go, how do we pitch. What do, how do we make the pitch? Like, like how do we sell? Uh, you know, there's just too many questions, and I think us being here collectively will definitely demystify a lot of these things, and we can handhold it through the process. And I think it's the responsibility of not only broadcasters and commissioners like ourselves, but we have to together evolve this model because, unfortunately, the system has been broken. Apart from three, four broadcasters, like somebody in the uh, audience also said, there's literally no one else commissioning documentaries from India, right? So we have to create that resurgence, uh, give voice to the, you know, filmmakers with stories who, you know, want to tell, and then we kind of move it onward from there. I mean, we have to do, we have to do that together, yeah. Uh, yeah. 
Um, is there any other question on the audience? Or should I ask the, uh, the others on the panel to kind of give their last words on this? Yes, Rita. Yeah. Thank uh, you. I'm Rita Meher. I'm from Tetsu Film Festival in Seattle, Washington. So uh, thank you so much for pointing me out. Uh, anytime any filmmaker writes to us, we really read the email and make sure they get a waiver if they're an independent filmmaker. We make that a rule for us. So we pretty much give out 80% waiver to our film festival. But that point aside, uh, yes, going to a festival is very important, but uh, I don't know how it works in Asia, but in uh, US and North America side, film festivals are NGOs. So we are a nonprofit and every penny counts and budget is are tight. So we try to bring as many filmmakers as possible. But that point aside, yes, it's important to go, but also stay in touch with the film festivals and ask them to promote your film. So that's one thing is very important when a filmmaker submits a film and the film is being shown and they wash their hands off, okay, Hamari, our film is being shown and it's uh, business is done. But make sure the festival really highlights and elevates your film. Uh, uh, the way we do is we create uh, stories and reels for each film that's being shown through our platform and uh, those are broadcast it out and uh, really uh, we don't just do the main filmmakers but everyone is gets the equal amount of promotion so that's very important you need to be seen through the festival where you're being submitted and uh, there's a lot of different strategies uh, uh, and the festival has the responsibility once they show the film that they're uh, you give it to other, uh, like these are the films that we selected, would anyone be interested? So ask them the questions that what could be done more about your film. So just think about other ways. That's fabulous. That's fabulous. <laughs> really and uh, I just want to add, we also became the one and only uh, Oscar qualifying film festival, South Asian film festival in the world. So that also puts your film in front of many uh, important people. So. Nita. Yeah, I completely echo all of that and like so strongly. Um, in terms of like funding models and in terms of supporting filmmakers as an NGO, as a charity, we are sort of responsible, uh, we are responsive of funds. And one really nice thing that we've been able to do in response to funds allocated for different things has been even though during the festival we haven't had the funds for, um, you know, supporting filmmakers, post-festival we've been able to do um, screenings with um, partner cinemas, which has come from a different fund and has allowed us to sp spend money to get filmmakers over. And that's been focused on films that don't get theatrical release in the UK specifically. So that the films that are gonna get theatrical release, they don't need support from us as much. Um, and yeah, so I completely echo that. And again, exactly the same. If you're an Oscar qualifying festival, it's the people that are watching it as well. It's the press that are coming there. It's the AMPAC members that are gonna be there, um, the BAFTA members that know that this is an Oscar qualifying festival. Because if they go to a festival, it's easier for them to get through the films, right? They want to see the films and it's just making sure that they come and that we do work on that. We make sure that they come, we make sure that we invite them, we make sure we in in incentivize them. And speaking for documentary film festivals specifically, when you're a documentary in a documentary film festival, you get space. We very consciously reduced our program, like very consciously reduced it to fewer films so that if each film gets more attention. Because even though we had a larger program, it was not necessarily best for the films because they were getting lost. And sometimes documentary gets lost in fiction, f with in fiction festivals as well. <laughs> um, is there anybody else in the audience? I saw one hand up there. I think this is gone. Um, so I, I think just some last words, Suganda, just coming back to you and then Samarth. Uh, in terms of, you know, do you see the potential of, uh, you know, creating licensing agreements which create a longer life for the documentary beyond where it reaches through uh, Film Caravan? Absolutely. Um, once we reach a digital platform and um, if we do an exclusive deal, like um, somebody pointed out, uh, then of course 
that's that's one platform which will reach um, 150 countries that it's live in. Uh, but having said that, um, exposure in film festivals, um, alternate uh, uh, routes, uh, there are some, like National Geographic uh, exposes your documentary, not just to satellite, but they also have Disney Hotstar as their digital partner. So we get a combined deal of a satellite and a digital exposure. Um, and yeah, I think there's a lot more I need to study and learn after listening to this panel. And particularly in your case, you know, uh, my heart goes out. And yes, uh, you know, I need to do more homework. Maybe we can have another panel <laughs> and discuss how we can get, um, you know, filmmakers to reach different countries and showcase uh, their films. Um, but yes, Film Caravan is always there. In, if you need any help in distribution, any handholding, uh, your precious child is ours. And uh, we would love to take it forward and uh, get it the release that it truly deserves. You know, end of the day, why do we make films? We make it to show the world, you know. And that's where we all uh, play our roles and we are always there for you. Thank you. Samarth, any last words for you as a filmmaker yeah. who begins the journey? Yes. So I, I think it's a very exciting time for documentaries. And I think, uh, you know, we were even discussing that five or six years ago, there wasn't any space for docu-series. You know, it's, it's a separate issue, many of them may be true crime. Uh, but uh, the fact is, even that didn't exist five, six years ago. Uh, I think the kind of achievements Indian feature documentaries have had in the last three years, you know, we've won at Cannes twice, we've won at Sundance thrice, and two of our films are at Oscars for, for the last three years. and. Uh, I mean, that's certainly very exciting. So we are pushing the boundaries. And uh, hopefully, with all these efforts, the gatekeepers will also start pushing their own boundaries of, uh, you know, there is certain preconceived notion with the word documentary. So I think uh, the makers are really pushing the boundaries. And uh, we are at it. I think that's, that's where we are at. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I think it is, it is a time where the documentary needs to take center stage in our lives, in our geographies, in our different spaces. Uh, we have come a full circle. The Indian documentary is reaching out and getting that kind of eyeballs. It didn't get, perhaps, over the years. Um, I still prefer to use the word documentary than nonfiction cinema, because I don't think we need to get our identity from fiction. We need to have the documentary identity. And I think platforms like this, panels like this, give us hope with all the different uh, strategies and all the different verticals where we can keep strategizing to reach audiences from festivals upwards and onwards fr at the ground, physical screenings, one-to-one -one conversations, markets, festivals. So thank you, Film Bazaar, for giving us this platform for this panel. Thank you, each of you, for being here and giving us uh, some valuable time and uh, inputs and thank you for this wonderful audience. Thank you, Achal, for being a wonderful moderator. Thank you. We'll be starting with our next session in the next two minutes. We'll need uh, two minutes to do the stage setup. The next uh, session is State Focus Destination Uttarakhand, a film-friendly state.